As I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, our partners in Malawi are experiencing um, a, a real famine. They've had uh, both uh, um, a flood in the spring, and now they're having, they've had a drought, and they're, the food is, scar is sparse. And so I've asked uh, Melinda Kaya if he would come forward. He's uh, uh, a friend of our congregation. He's here almost every Sunday morning. If he's not, he's out some, to some other church. And uh, he is a pastor there, and um, uh, he's studying this year at, uh, at the seminary downtown, you know, the, the, the Presbyterian Seminary. And so um, let me just ask you a couple questions. Tell us what is taking place there to meet this need as we think about giving an offering next week and making next Sunday a, t a day of prayer and fasting. Uh, what is taking place in Malawi? Yeah, as far as my, co my synod is concerned, they are organizing <coughs> uh, through its department, relief and development to organize, maybe they can find food to help those who are really die in need of food. Secondly, they are organizing a prayer uh, and fasting. Uh, sometime maybe next week I was talking to my general secretary last, last night. He was saying that we would want to, uh, to organize prayer and fasting so that we can pray to God that this year maybe he can give us grace to receive uh, abundant rain. Because if we don't have rains, then it will be hit again. So these are the two things that are so actually. distribution, making sure where the needs are, yes. and getting uh, the uh, the food, uh, the grain to where the needs are. That's the first thing, and and there are as many uh, as two hundred thousand people possibly who may be in need. Is that accurate? Yes, it's estimated about two hundred thousand people that are without food. So wow. the church is organizing maybe how best we can do it. To, provide food for the, the And then people. thinking in terms of uh, next year and next year's growing season, uh, praying and fasting that, uh, that it would be a good growing season at the, and, and things would be right uh, for, for good crops. Yes, of course, of course. And we're also thinking about in seed to plant because you don't, this year you don't have seeds, then next year we'll need a bit sure. of seeds. Sure. Yes. Well, very good. So next week, again, we'll just be taking a, a special offering and, and uh, want to be low-key on that. For you who uh, are able to, as a kind of second-mile giving, we would, we would invite you to do so. And it wasn't too long ago that my two brothers from Malawi were up here and, uh, and sharing with us that this could happen. They said it was a possibility, and certainly it is now. So let's just take a moment to pray for Malawi. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for what you do around the world and grateful for the partnership w which we have with Malawi and not only with the one church, the Manyamula church, but also we have a sense of partnership with the whole church of Malawi. And so God, I pray now that you would speak to us this week and where we are able, help us to give of our means so that they might have food. Thank you so much for my brother, Melinda Kalia, and I pray that you would bless him and continue to be with him. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jim Cubs. You're very uh, welcome. On behalf of my country, let me thank you for your concern that maybe next time you might be praying over my life. I'm here, I'm eating like Nehemiah, but my heart is back home. Yes. Please help us. Thank you. Yes. God bless you. I was at a conference in, uh, a couple months ago, and one of the, the key speakers who I cannot get him out of my mind talked about, uh, he, was a, he was a man who was of the, from the Church of England, uh, and also a man who was really a student of culture. He's kind of an uh, amateur anthropologist, and he's really a student of the culture uh, here in the United States as well as certainly England too. And he was talking about the millennials, and he said, you know what the millennials need more than anything else? And you, as a Presbyterian church, have the possibility to do this as well as any other church. And he says what they need more than anything else, at least their, their felt need, is to be a part of a family, an extended family. We went to a workshop that he hosted, and he asked millennials, is that true? And person after person said, yes, yes. 
And then he went a bit further, and he asked, would any of you like to say something? One young pastor got up. He was probably in his uh, late 20s. And he said, uh, you know, one of the things that I've experienced in my family, which was a good family that loved me and cared for me, was that they outsourced parenting. <laughs> what does he mean by that, I thought? They outsourced parenting. He said what they did instead of, uh, uh, and, and this was out of love and trying to do the very best for me, but instead of my dad playing catch with me in the backyard, he got me a coach that he paid for. And then he went on with several other things that his family did because they loved him. They gave him the things that he really didn't need as much as that sense of family. And there's a whole generation out there that is feeling that need to belong. Well, certainly that's not just uh, that one generation. I think it's always been the case that all of us feel like we need to be able to share with someone what our lives are all about. Someone that we can trust. Someone who will lovingly hold us accountable. Someone who will allow us to feel like we belong in that relationship. I read this week about the study done in some of the Los Angeles gangs. And there are 450 gangs with about 45,000 people a part of those gangs. And there is a teacher who, a Los Angeles high school teacher named Ann P. Beattie, for many years has taught teens who belong to gangs. Here's what she said about the desperate drives underneath gang members. In gangs, people without families or without functional families find a place where they belong and are taken care of. The gang structure need, meets every basic need that a teenager has, food, clothing, protection, purpose, identity. For some members to leave the gang requires a rejection of everything they consider to be themselves. Getting violence out of our life is an abstract concept, but getting rid of your homies, that's real. Miss Beatty claims that gang violence is a symptom of deeper problems in families and society. Advertising appeals to the most basic instincts of human nature, she says, to the things that really get us salivating, sex, money, and power. Kids are brought up on these goals, and they hunger after them. All kids do. But the lucky ones have parents, teachers, friends, mentors, who push them against this unholy trinity, who demonstrate instead the importance of love, community, and compassion. The lucky ones absorb only, the unlucky ones absorb only the messages and the media, and we all suffer from it. When we look at the New Testament, we find out that Timothy, who several years later became one of the leaders of the fledgling church, needed a spiritual mentor. Timothy was born in a backwater town of Lystra in Asia Minor. Timothy was from a mixed marriage. His mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek, and he was considered then to be illegitimate by all of the Jews. His father probably wasn't in the home, and so uh, either he had been a soldier who had moved on or he was dead. It come, he had experienced Paul's first missionary journey and had come to a point of faith in that missionary journey. And now five years later in the passage which I'm about to read, Paul comes back on a second missionary journey to follow up, and he comes across Timothy. It's important as we consider this series going deeper together and the relationships of a disciple that we not only think about who is our Lord, who are you, where is your Macedonia, who is your Barnabas, who's the one who's mentoring you, but as we think of these relationships, it's also crucial in our culture and every culture, to think of the people in whom we are pouring ourselves. Who is your Timothy? If you would, follow along with me as I read from Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Acts 16, 1 through 5. Listen now for the word of the Lord. He, speaking of Paul, came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, 
whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. May God add his blessing, understanding, and application upon this, the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this joy of being together today. And I pray now that as we spend these moments looking at Timothy and Paul and that relationship, I pray that you would speak to each one of us, speak to the people and the preacher alike. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. As we begin thinking about this, I believe that young Timothy filled a void left and for Paul, left by a man named young John Mark. Now, you've got to understand, Paul had studied under one of the greatest teachers of his day, a man named Gamaliel. And in that day, it was all about mentoring. A rabbi, like Gamaliel, or a great teacher, would have several prized students that he would pour himself into. So it was not only his words, but it was the way he lived that made a difference in that child or that person's life. Much like the teaching hospitals today, if you've been in one, you know how that there are interns and there are residents and there are fellows who are all following around a particular uh, doctor who's well thought of and who's a teacher, and they learn from him. Paul had been on track to be a gifted teacher himself. He was going to be a mentor. And as Paul more and more learned about Jesus after his Damascus Road experience, he realized realized that Jesus had been the consummate teacher, the consummate mentor pouring himself into his disciples through not only his words, but his actions and his life. Now, young John Mark was, as I think we mentioned a little bit last week, was the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas uh, uh, was with Paul when when they were sent out on that first missionary journey by the church of Antioch. And as they went along, young John Mark wanted to go home. And so somewhere along on the journey, he left and went home. And that really made Paul upset. How could he leave us like that? And so as they start the second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take him along again. Barnabas always wanting to give people second chances. Barnabas always wanting to pour himself into others and mentor others. And Paul says, nothing doing. And there's such a violent disagreement that they split ways. And Barnabas goes in one direction to Cyprus with young John Mark. And Paul goes in another direction, going back to Asia Minor, and he takes along Silas. Paul must have been stirred by his memories and the words that he heard about Timothy's growth and his story as they come into Lystra. Paul had a similar background. I mean, his mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek. Paul had pointed Timothy to Jesus. It's really exciting to have the privilege of pointing someone to Jesus. It's right up there in my mind with the birth of a child. When you see someone embrace the faith for himself, for herself, and want to become a follower of Jesus. Paul must have been thrilled to see how young Timothy had grown. Oh, it was his mother and his grandmother who had fostered that faith, who had nurtured him, who had loved him. I remember several years back receiving a letter from a guy that had been in my youth group 25 years ago, and I'm sure Mike receives these kind of letters all the time. But the letter said, you know what? 25 years ago at a certain place at a certain time, you pointed me to Jesus and I've been following every since, and he was writing from Africa where he was working uh, there with the people. Certainly many others had been instrumental in helping him to grow. While young John Mark might have been a pain in the neck at times, and I'm sure he was, and possibly he might have been slowing them down according to Paul's schedule, encountering Timothy must have made Paul realize how much he missed his youthful ways. 
how much he wanted someone in whom he could pour his life. At first, whether he realized it or not, Paul desperately needed a Timothy. In mentoring Timothy, Paul is following the example of Barnabas who had mentored him. Reading between the lines, as Paul moved along from town to town on that second missionary journey, he must have had a sense of nostalgia. This is where we did that, and this is where we did this. And he must have remembered the times when Barnabas had taken him under his wings and taught him at his elbow, as it were. He remembered how Barnabas had served as a much-needed reference to the early church when they were afraid of him. He remembered the gifts that Barnabas had and how he had used them so effectively. Paul was more of an intellectual teacher type, and Barnabas was more the relational people person. At least that's the way I surmise it. He remembered how Barnabas had patiently nurtured him. He remembered the joy that Barnabas seemed to experience when Paul began to be the leader, and they switched places. As they reached Lystra, he remembered how Barnabas had picked him up when they had stoned him and left him for dead outside the city. And it was Barnabas who had picked him up, and he had taken him back into the city. Again, reading between the lines, I imagine that the Holy Spirit moved within the heart of this passionate missionary, giving him the desire to follow the example of his beloved mentor. This must have been a strong movement of the Spirit when he saw young Timothy again when he saw his potential, when he saw what he could be. He gave thanks for his mother and his grandmother, and maybe due to his similar backgrounds, he, Timothy reminded of him, him of himself. I remember once a group of pastors that were gathered together in Atlanta, and the president of a seminary there said, you need to be looking for the best young people in your youth groups. You need to be looking for them and mentor them. Pour yourselves into them praying that God will do something special and that he will use them in the future. Well, Paul was the mentor to Timothy in such a way that he would desire to mentor others who would also mentor others. If we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we find what Paul says. Now, it's interesting to note that this is a letter when Paul is in prison, and the second letter, many scholars would say, would be shortly before his execution. And so now he knows he's pouring himself through a letter into Timothy. This may be the last chance that he ever has to communicate with him. And Timothy, for all kinds of reasons, is rather timid. He's maybe fearful, most scholars would say. And, and maybe it's because he's grieving the fact that his mentor is about to lose his life, possibly. Or maybe it's just the kind of personality that he had. Here's what Paul says. You then, my son, dripping with meaning, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying, like the words of Jesus, when he was speaking his last words to his disciples, Paul challenges his protege to pass on the things that he has heard him say to other reliable people who will also do the same in turn. There was, they were all to be built on the same premise. The one being mentored would mentor others who would mentor others, and you would have an exponential multiplication. I like the words that I read this week from the president of World Vision, a man named Rich Stearns. He talked about the the domino theory of spiritual impact, and I think we could say it's a domino theory of mentoring. He says, imagine a long line of dominoes, and you know when you push one that they push others and others and others, and he said, you know, it could take hundreds, it could take thousands of dominoes, and you've seen some of these where they have them lined up uh, all over the place. Well, he talks about that, and he says, Jesus had 12 dominoes, as it were, 12 disciples, and now there are 2 billion followers of Christ in the world. He says that's a lot of dominoes. He provides the following story about the spiritual impact that one person made. In the, in the 1880s, Robert Wilder, a missionary kid from India, 
was preparing to return to the mission field, but he found that his, he had physical problems and wasn't able to do so, and so he wanted to encourage others to do that, to go to the mission field. So one domino fell. During a preaching tour that was in Chicago, he spoke to an audience that included Samuel Moffat. Samuel had signed a pledge like Robert had pledged, and within two years, he landed in Korea. Another domino fell. A few years later, Samuel shared the gospel with a man who had become disillusioned with his Taoist practice. Kiel San Chu trusted Christ, and quickly another domino fell. In 1907, Kiel was one of the leaders of a great revival there. In January of that year, spontaneous prayer and confession broke out during the regular church meetings. Thousands of dominoes fell. Those days of fervent prayer are now considered the birth of an independent, self-sustaining Korean church. When Kiel died in 1935, 5,000 people attended his funeral. The church in Korea now numbers about 15 million, and it sends more foreign missionaries than any other country outside of the United States. Millions of dominoes continue to fall. And here's what Stern says. As Christians, we are all dominoes in the chain reaction set up by Jesus 2,000 years ago. The amazing thing about dominoes falling is that the chain reaction always starts small, just one seemingly insignificant domino. Whether you are sponsoring children, filling backpacks for children in the inner city schools, talking to your own children, or praying earnestly for people around the globe, you have no idea how big the impact will be as God multiplies your faithfulness. As we think about that, I would ask you the question, who is your Timothy? This week, I had a person call me that I hadn't talked to in a couple years. He was my Barnabas, and we had a 45-minute conversation. It was so great to catch up. I also had a person call me yesterday morning who was like a Timothy to me. He was calling from a hospital room. His daughter, who was like six years old, had been mauled the day before by a Rottweiler, and she was in surgery at a children's hospital in Indianapolis, and he called me one who had been his mentor, asked me to pray. I received a picture this morning from another man that I've mentored through the years in Indianapolis, works for the NCAA, and he was um, in Chicago. He and his wife are in their mid-40s, never had children, desperately wanted children, and there at Wrigley Field, (laughs) the ball game last week, they were holding their little child, one whom they were adopting, tremendous sense of joy. If you're a mentor, if you have a Timothy, they're going to be the good times and the bad times. They're going to be the times when they desperately need you and the times when they want you to celebrate with them. But I tell you, we all need to have Timothys, celebrating successes and caring for failures and losses. For some of you, it may be your children or your grandchildren. In the covenant class this week, We talked about people who had influenced us in the faith. And person after person after person talked about about parents and grandparents. Alice has, and my wife, has wonderfully mentored my daughter and now my granddaughter. Your Timothy may also be someone with whom you work, someone with whom you spend all kinds of relational time. Your Timothy may be in your sphere of friends. Maybe your Timothy may be in a program uh, of mentorship like that which we have with Williams Elementary School. Are you willing to take, are you willing to ask God to lead you to a Timothy whom you could mentor and whom you could pour yourself? I've grown unbelievably through the privilege of mentoring other people. Right now, I have the privilege of mentoring three other pastors, one in, one in um, Oregon, one in Tennessee, and one in, in Pennsylvania. We're going to be continuing this morning our art project, and maybe you sat on a piece of paper this morning, and you wondered, what is that all about? Well, last week we started with uh, naming someone who might be your Barnabas, but this week, if you have someone who is your Timothy, And it may be, again, your child or your grandchild. It may be someone that you're 
working with at Williams School or, or Menace de Cristo or, or other places. It may be someone that you meet with and talk to on a regular basis, being a spiritual mentor to them. If there is a person like that, write that person's name down there. Put it down. And maybe, as we've talked about this, you've thought about someone whom you might mentor, someone in whom you might pour your life and be a, a spiritual friend to that person. If that's the case, you might want to write that person's name down. Or maybe this is all new, and you might just want to say, God, help me find a Timothy. I would invite all of you to write something down. And then as we sing our last song, we are going to ask the ushers, if they would, to, to pick these up. And, and again, Beth has got this figured out in a wonderful way. And it's going to, there's going to be something within the next couple of weeks that's going to be a community art project that really demonstrates the importance of having a mentor, having uh, one whom we mentor, and then also having an Antioch to be supportive underneath all of that. So if you would, please complete that in any way that you so choose. And at this time, let us join together in prayer. God, I'm so grateful for the privilege of coming together here today, grateful for your word which speaks to us in all times and seasons, grateful that your Holy Spirit takes words that are stumbling and sometimes failing, and yet your word speaks to us with the presence of the Spirit. And God, I pray that you would be in our world today. We know that you are but I pray that you would work in special ways in those places that where people are in warfare, where people are hungry, where people are needy. And I pray that even close to home, you would give us a passion for those who have needs. Help us more and more to see the world, to vision the world as you see it. And God, we pray specifically for those people in our congregation who are going through difficult times who are going through different kinds of therapy and treatments, who are going through all kinds of, uh, uh, of, of pain and, and, and deprivation in some ways. Pray for those people that are going to be with us tonight and, and this week uh, with the Interfaith uh, Hospitality Network. And God, I pray that uh, you would uh, give them a deep sense of love that comes from you. Help us to exhibit your love. Be with us as we go out into our daily lives this week. Help us to be your ambassadors, sharing your light with a world that often feels dark and dreary. Thank you, God, for your presence with us. Continue to be with us as we leave this place and scatter out into the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.